Welcome from a very windy Albuquerque, New Mexico. My name is Virga. And I'm Gary. You, of course, are listening or watching Curiosity Not Judgment, and we're super glad to have you be part of this episode. I want to talk today about, does it cost you anything to be for somebody else? And as easy as it might be to answer that just off the top of your head, I think we really need to dive in and think about it a little bit more deeply, because unfortunately, many of us, knowingly or unknowingly, really camp out in a... I'm going to say a poverty mindset or a lack mindset. And because of that, the concept of being for someone may not come as easily or naturally as you might hope. Well, being for someone, let's define that first. Okay. What does it mean to be for someone? I would say to be an advocate, to be in their corner, to be an ally. So in other words, when I'm talking with you or interacting with you, if I'm for you, then I'm for your good, mm -hmm. I'm for your progress, Yes. I'm for your agenda? Uh, I don't know. Well, maybe it could be misconstrued. Uh, there could be potentially the thought process that you have to be for someone's agenda. I guess I'm, I'm not, when I think of it, I don't think of having to match agendas or match politics or any of those things, but to be for the person themselves, to want the person to do well, to accomplish, to succeed. But I guess I, I see already where these lines could get muddied. Sure, because um, I can be for you and not for your agenda. Right. Or I may think that your agenda is misguided or needs more information, mm -hmm. like we talked about with paradigms. It might be incomplete, or it might be something that I think you think is good for you and I think is not good for you. Mm -hmm. um, I think that happens to a us a lot as parents, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. And so I'm totally for you, but I'm not necessarily for what you're your trying choices. to accomplish in mm -hmm. your choices, right? So yes. and, and just a, as an example. And so I think that gets misconstrued. Um, you know, we used to talk about the difference between empathy and sympathy. Right. Empathy is, I, I get it. I mm -hmm. see what you're trying to say. I can repeat back to you, to your satisfaction, mm -hmm. that I've heard you, uh, but I don't agree with you. Right. Agree, agreement is sympathy. And I heard you as empathy. Mm. So uh, I think that comes to play here. Yeah. I can have empathy and be for you, but not agree with you. Yeah. Now, in this day and age, it's almost legendary that people that you don't agree with, you don't even want to associate with. Mm. Right? Mm -hmm. um, if you don't sympath have sympathy with me, I don't care about your empathy. Right. You clearly don't understand me if you don't agree with me. Yeah. If you understood me, you don't, you'd agree with me. Or if you understood the situation, you'd agree with me. And I think we, we get caught in that a lot of times. So yeah. I think it's important to differentiate between that. You're right. And I guess I hadn't really thought too far down that line about how confusing it can be in our own hearts and minds as we're trying to figure out the difference and, and how do you navigate being for someone without being for their agenda. And so for argument's sake, let's, let's paint this picture in a, in a workplace setting where you are all working for the same company. Mm -hmm. Maybe you're in different divisions, maybe you have different supervisors, maybe you have different objectives for your division, your department, but ultimately you're all employed, employed by the same company. And so I would hope that maybe the concept of being for your colleagues, for your coworkers, might come a little bit more naturally or, or come in a less confusing manner when you're not having to worry necessarily about an agenda. And yet, <laughs> um, I think we've all found ourselves many times in places where while we all believe that we should all be in alignment and all go be going the same direction in a, in a company, and we, we have the classic image in our head of if we're all rowing the same direction, then we're going to get there. If we're rowing in different directions, we won't. So we should be in alignment. Hmm. If my direction is the same as yours. Hmm. If it's not, well, maybe we ought to be going over this way and maybe I'm not so for you. Oh, this is a tough one. It is. I, I want this to be easier. <laughs> <laughs> well, then we just take humans out of it and it'll be super easy. Done. Okay. <laughs> oh, you know, I, I stumble in this arena so many times, not that I don't want to be for people, but that I get frustrated when I think, does it cost you anything to be for me? 
And, and I know it's a two-way street and I definitely need to reciprocate and I hope that I do. I, I try to be for the people in my lives, even if we don't match agendas, just in the sense of I see you as a person, I value you, and I want to be for your successful iteration of life, whatever that looks like, without necessarily subscribing to ideology or agenda. But as we are finding out, even in the first five minutes, that is no simple task. I think it's, it's too bad that we often, and we, I'm saying I often, uh, mistake uh, someone's objection to one of my ideas, which I sometimes take personally and I should not. Mm. Um, when I'm uncomfortable, I sometimes try to prove and protect my ideas and my agenda. And that puts me at odds with you, mm. uh, even though it shouldn't. Um, as we've talked about before, if I have an idea, I should be able to put it out in the center of the table and talk about it objectively like everybody else. But I have some ownership for that idea. And when you talk about what's the cost of being for someone, I think internally, whether we think about it out loud or consciously or not, we feel like we might be giving up some of our agenda and some of what we want if I pay too much attention listening to you. Mm. You know, the scarcity mentality or that poverty mentality that I mentioned at the beginning is a real deal that we have to battle in our minds because we see things as limited pools of resource. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I, I'm guessing you could come up with lots of different examples in your own work sphere or your own family dynamics. But if you have a budget of, you know, $500,000, if I believe things should be done with this money and you believe different things should be done with this money, I can't be for you because then you're going to take some of my money out of the pot. And while, there's maybe some legitimacy to a finite number around a budget. I think the ultimate quest is how do I be for you in a way where I just don't feel threatened mm -hmm. and where I can respectfully promote the ideas that I have because I've been hired to do this job and I can respectfully listen to your ideas and just trust whoever the decision maker is it's gonna go in the direction that they feel best suits the company and not have it diminish my, you know, my self, my, my value, my perception of, of myself if you get picked over me. Or if your ideas get picked right. over me or if um, the decision maker leans more towards you. You bring in the decision maker. One of my pet peeves is for people to abdicate to the manager, the supervisor, the leader. Um, and, and because I've been in leadership positions before and it's like, uh, you know, why don't you two just go work it out? Mm. And I think that, that when you say, well, I hope the, the decision maker goes my way, it's almost like uh, abdicating the responsibility of working through something with somebody to where you can come to an, a win-win agreement. Um, and, and not that that's bad or that's, and sometimes it's necessary. Sometimes you have to come up with a proposal with somebody else that's going to go to a decision maker and the decision maker is going to kind of, uh, and, and do you give them an A and a B and here's what I would lean for. And that's what the other person would lean for. Try mm -hmm. not to put your names on it so they don't know. Yeah. Um, I mean, it, 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 there's so many dynamics in this mm -hmm. and I think that that's, that's where we get stuck. It's easy to say. I am for everyone in my company because I want my company to be successful because the more successful my company is, the better off we're all going to do. Mm. But in reality and in practice, it's, it's rare. Yeah, I think you're right. I think it's very rare. And so let's maybe look in, in a family setting over a business setting. And well, because that'll be easier. Well, I mean, putting Miracle Girl on your problems, that's a family, right? Hmm, perhaps, <laughs> perhaps. But I'm, I, I certainly want people as, as they're listening and watching to, as they think through this to see how this really applies in different dynamics Absolutely. and different settings. And so let's talk through what this might look like at home. So, uh, you know, you, one could argue, I always love it when someone says nonprofit versus paid business. And like, well, of course, Gary, it's easier for you because you, you pay your employees. They have to do what you want to do. It's like, my goodness, if that was the paradigm I've set up, that they mm. do things just because I tell them and they have to because I pay them, that's, that's a whole other set of problems. But, sure. but let's go with family. In family situations, one would hope that people are for each other more. But when I made the joke about putting Miracle Grow on our problems, I think sometimes the family members are, well, two things. 
One, we might feel so comfortable around family members that we are our true abrasive selves with mm. no filters and it makes it even harder to get along with folks. I can see that. The other one is I love you too much. In other words, um, I am not going to allow you to make your own mistakes and have your own growth and learning through your own mm -hmm. uh, little mistakes because I want to micromanage you and I know what's best for you and you just need to do what I tell you to mm -hmm. do. So I, those two dynamics, I think, are thrown in even and above the, what happens in the workplace, which is just mismatch of agendas. Yeah. Ooh, this is a doozy. And I, I wish we had some simple follow these steps at the end of this episode and everyone could go on their merry way and feel, you know, well equipped to handle this problem. But I think there are a ton of questions that we need to start asking ourselves when we find ourselves in a situation where we've got somebody abrasive at home, at work, in the neighborhood, wherever it is. If you want to start with the question, does it cost me anything to be for this person? You have to, I guess, walk down those paths of navigating. You know, what does it mean? What does it look like for me to be for them? And what happens if it's perceived that I'm supporting their agenda? What happens if it's perceived that I am, you know, getting behind somebody who I don't share the same values with? And then does it cost you other relationships? These are legitimate questions you have to ask. And they're hard questions, yeah. but I think there are things you can do. We won't have all the answers, of course, uh, but I think there are some things you can do. We talked, you know, last week, week before about, you know, setting expectations, matching pace, frictionless transactions, which we've turned into friendly fi friction. But I think that, the, the, and there's going to be friendly friction, hopefully friendly friction uh, in any interaction, mm -hmm. right? And so I think setting those expectations up front, um, saying to someone, I am for you. Mm -hmm. What does that look like to you? How, how can I show you that I'm for you? Well, you should agree with everything I say. That's probably not going to happen. Right. Are there other ways I can show? Well, at least show you that, show me that you've listened to me. Okay, I can work with that. Yeah. Right? How, how can I do that? Right. Repeat back exactly and then tell me why you think I'm wrong and then I'm going to defend that. Okay. We can do that. Is that the best way, right? Mm -hmm. I think so. I think having a discussion around that is fine. I think reminding someone every time you're going to have a discussion, I'm for you, mm. uh, and saying those words out loud might have some good positive effect. Yeah. Well, I think that's a powerful statement. And then asking that question out loud, I, we're embarrassed or we're prideful or we're whatever that we don't bother to say that out loud. Say, hey, mm -hmm. Gary, I'm for you, but mm -hmm. I don't know what that looks like. How how does that play out? Exactly. So can you, can you help me know how to be for you? And it's a bold question to ask, and it takes some vulnerability, but man, would that go a long way in helping to break down some of those problems. There was an author, and I can't remember his name right now, except for his first one, because it's a great one, Gary. Yeah. <laughs> um, but he wrote The Five Love, Love Languages. Oh, Chapman. Gary Chapman. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, um, and he would say things like, we often mess up in relationships because we think we're showing our love in mm -hmm. one way, but the other person's love language is something different. You know, quality time versus giving gifts versus whatever. And I, I think that everybody has the same love mm -hmm. language that I do, so I do what I like. Right. Whereas the other, it could be a complete mismatch with mm -hmm. the other person. Well, I think we're coming into a little bit of that there. Mm -hmm. um, showing you how I'm for you may I'm, I'm my actions may be showing you that I am not for you mm. when my motivation is I actually am it's funny that you bring up the love languages because I think he actually did write a version of that book that had to do with work situations mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so I don't know if I, I've not read that one I don't know if it directly correlates but the the love languages is for those of you that have not heard of them physical touch acts of service quality time, gifts, and what's the fifth one? Do you know off the top of your head? I'm so impressed you got four. Well, the fifth one will come to me. But to your point, if your love language is physical touch and you, you know, are, are patting your wife on the back, stroking her arm, touching her hair, and her love language is quality time, and you're doing that in the three minutes that you have together once a week, it's a misfire, right? <laughs> yeah, that's right. And so same thing holds true to the work setting. 
again, maybe it's not a direct parallel and physical touch. You got to really watch at the workplace. But yeah. you know, if if the way that I feel heard and loved and appreciated is acts of service, mm -hmm. was that the one that I forgot? Maybe acts of service. Yeah. You know, if I if I want you, and and this really is my love language, um, acts of service is mine, and you are gifts. You in the workplace, if you you know leave a candy bar on my desk, that's great. But really, what I need you to do serve you. It, yeah, in some capacity, mm -hmm. and so you can imagine how again, the the personal, e even the best intention, if your personal language is what you're trying to force onto everybody else, they're not likely receiving it well, or at least not in the the fullness of how you could be engaging with one another. So how do we find out? love mm -hmm. languages without asking people what's your love language they may not have the context it may be an inappropriate question yeah you know how do we do that well i maybe we start with finding that book and yeah. seeing what he says yeah. about the business well but we all don't workplace. have to read a book to, to get along certainly. I, I think a lot of it comes down to the whole gtkeo which i like to say out loud but it's it's getting to know each other mm. and you know in a uh, in a, one of our previous podcasts, uh, we talk about, you know, if you don't like someone, take them to lunch, mm -hmm. which is the opposite of what we usually do. We usually go to lunch with people we think like us. Mm -hmm. But but getting to know the other person and is a way to figure out intuitively how they operate and what they like. Um, and, you know, extroverts are different than introverts, and there's different love languages, there's different personality types, there's mm -hmm. different all kinds of different things that make us unique and valuable. Mm. Um, but when we're, when we're talking about human interaction, those things can sometimes get in the way if we don't recognize them and if we don't talk about them. And, yeah. and you know, I know this can sometimes feel, I'm, I'm thinking back to my early Intel engineer self going, what, you know, this soft stuff, hmm. just do your job, right? Do your work and, yeah. then, that'll, and then I'll respect you. But it, it is, as I've mellowed over the years and realized that it's all about relationships. And if, it, mm. if, there's, if, the relationship, if the relationship isn't there, the work is so much harder yes. than if the relationship is there. Right. The reciprocal of I'm for you is, hey, you know what? Thank you for being for me. I'm for you too. And you bring up a topic. It's like, sure, let's do that. Mm. If, I don't, if, I, if I don't think you're for me, Mm -hmm. well, we're not doing that just because you said it. Mm, that's right. You know, as you're talking about the getting to know you process and really having to be intentional, and I, I don't know how many times we've said this over the last, what are we at, 60 episodes now. Mm -hmm. I, I think this is a theme that we have drummed repeatedly, and it, and it needs to continue to be drummed into all of us, is that intentionality to get to know one another, to listen to hear, not listen to respond, and all of these different things. But I, I heard a phrase that was new to me, I think earlier this week, which was listen for the ashes. Mm. In other words, everybody's got pain. They've got some degree of pain, whether you've got a wayward child, you've got a, you know, a difficult marriage, you've got financial woes, all kinds of different problems. Various levels of traumas. Everyone. Yeah. If yep. you're having conversation, inevitably, there's going to be kind of that trail of ashes that if you're intentional, you can pick up on. And not to in any way manipulate or abuse mm. that exposure to somebody's pain, but to be purposeful to say, hey, I, I picked up on this. Is there a way I can support you in this challenge? Is there, is there a way that I can come alongside you in this difficulty? That may go a whole long way in being for somebody. And it does cost you time. It costs you a willingness to really hear and engage. And if, the, if somebody says, yeah, I'm really struggling in this area and I need somebody to talk to, and you're that person, it could cost you. But man, what a, hopefully what a delight it would be at the very end of it is if you knew that you were able to make a difference in somebody's life simply by being intentional. You, you bring up a good point. And, and I think that that's a, it's such um, this is one of those things that's not complicated, it's just hard. Mm -hmm. um, it's hard to, to take the time, and that's my personal issue. And we talked about agenda and I, I threw that out there. But it's really, um, we talked about matching pace mm -hmm. uh, a couple of weeks ago. And for me, matching pace is painful. 
Mm -hmm. um, because in my perception, that means we're slowing down. Mm. The obvious answer is, is that you slow down to go fast. In other words, you, you take that time and then everything's easier. But in the moment, it feels like it's painful to slow down, do this work mm -hmm. on figuring out how to get along and how to be more effective together so that we can be effective together later. Right. I may just see you as a roadblock to getting something done quickly and then it just spirals. Mm -hmm. You know, we get into that vicious cycle of believing that we're not for each other, we're against each other. I always want to do this and you always want to do that and I want to move fast, you want to move slow, you want to plan, I want to just do. And those kinds of things can make relationships so much harder. When if we did the relationship, you know, I know you said, does it cost us anything to be for somebody? Almost like a joke at mm -hmm. the beginning. But we're, we're as we discover, mm -hmm. it is hard to do and yeah. it does cost us in our own minds. Otherwise, no, everybody would do it. Everybody would be for each other. And for me, the answer is, it feels like it takes too much time. Mm. And I don't have any time because I'm trying to do too much stuff. Yeah. Good stuff, by the way. I know. I believe it. I believe it. <laughs> no, I'm just I'm saying that because it's how silly it sounds. I'm trying to do good stuff by trying to run over you instead of take the time to do it with you, mm. which doesn't make any sense. Yeah. I think the one takeaway from this episode that is duplicate, du we can duplicate it, <laughs> whatever that word was that I couldn't spit out, is really asking that question out loud. What would it look like for me to be for you? How, how do I support you in this role, in this whatever it is? And I, I want to practice that. And, and I'm, I won't put you on the spot right now, but maybe for you to think about it as you and I engage, you know, what does it look like for me to be for you? Because I don't actually know in a practical way often. You know, I've got some assumptions based on all of the time that we've spent together, but, you know, offline we can have that conversation. What does it look like for me to support you? And I would actually have to stop and put some thought into it if you asked me that question back. I, I don't know that I could quickly give you an answer because what you being for me, it would look a lot different than my husband being for me or for another colleague to be for me because I know your temperament, I know your giftings, and so the answer really has to be tailored to the person asking. It does, and it has to be tailored to the relationship. You yeah. and I have known each other long enough to where I know you're for me. And so even if you do the thing that's, I, that I hate the most, I know we've got that emotional bank account, we've got that, mm -hmm. that relationship to where it doesn't bother me as much. But I found that people bother me when I, when I put out an idea, if they start shooting holes in it right away. Mm. Or if they say, no, that'll never work. Instead of saying, yeah, Gary, um, that's good. Um, can I ask about this or this? Those little nuanced ways of mm -hmm. talking when I talk to people, I'll never forget somebody, one of my colleagues and business partners in the past said, Gary, you've got so many ideas and so many things going on. Could you just put a percentage on what you think is going to work or not? Mm. I, I Just give me a 50%, 70%. It doesn't even have to be accurate, but just I, I just never know. Mm -hmm. Are you thinking this is going to happen tomorrow? Is this going to happen tomorrow? You know, and, and it made a difference mm -hmm. in our relationship. So I think it, it's a two-way street. Yeah. I need to remember to ask you how mm -hmm. it looks like that, that to, to show that I'm for you. And you need to be able to say, by the way, if you just did this one little thing, mm. it would make a big difference. I'm happy to do it. Yeah. If I can, A, I'm aware of it, and mm -hmm. B, remember, I may not be perfect at it, but at sure. least I'll know. Yep. All right. Well, once again, it comes down to asking questions, and in this case, asking them out loud. So we will wrap this one up and, of course, always point you to the webpage, curiositynotjudgment.com, where you are welcome to drop a comment. And if you are listening on a podcast format that gives you the opportunity to leave a rating or a comment, please do that. If you leave a rating that allows other people to see and it just you know gets in front of more people. So we always appreciate that encouragement. So thank you very much in advance and we'll see you next time. Take care.